Hey guys, welcome back. I hope you are having an amazing day. Let's get right into the stories. The first one is an entitled people story. I couldn't believe my eyes when I saw my neighbor Kenny riding his loud ATV across my private hunting land. This wasn't the first time he had trespassed, but it would be the last. My family owns a large plot of wooded land outside of town that we use for hunting. We've had it for generations, and it's always been private property. The land is posted with clear, no trespassing signs on every side, but my inconsiderate neighbor Kenny seems to think he can use my land however he pleases. Last autumn during hunting season, I was sitting in my tree stand when I heard the roar of an engine. Kenny came flying by on his obnoxious ATV, scaring away all the deer. I shouted at him, but he just waved and kept right on going. I confronted him afterwards and told him to stay off my property. Kenny shrugged it off like no big deal and said he was just passing through. He refused to apologize or even acknowledge that what he did was wrong. After that incident, I installed game cameras all around the perimeter of my land. I was determined to catch Kenny in the act next time. Sure enough, a few weeks later I checked the footage and there he was, cruising across my hunting land on his ATV with a buddy. This time I called the police. The officer came out and took a report, but said there was nothing they could really do unless I had evidence of repeated trespassing. I knew then I had to take matters into my own hands. I invested in surveillance equipment and captured multiple instances of Kenny trespassing over the next few months. I compiled all the evidence, the game camera footage, videos from surveillance cameras, and records of the dates and times. Finally, I had solid proof that Kenny was repeatedly and intentionally trespassing on my posted private property. I enlisted my lawyer and we sent Kenny a formal cease and desist letter demanding he stop. But of course he didn't. The next weekend I wasn't surprised when I saw Kenny out mudding on his ATV across my hunting land yet again. This time, though, I was ready for him. I called the police and two officers showed up. I presented them with all my documentation the ownership records proving the land was mine, the posted signage, the compiled evidence of Kenny's repeated trespassing. When Kenny tried to claim he didn't realize this was private property, I pulled out my ace in the hole, an old map I had found showing the boundaries of my land going back 50 years. Kenny's family may have only lived in the area for a generation, but mine had been here for centuries. The officers issued Kenny a citation on the spot for trespassing and escorted him off my property. As he was leaving, the main officer turned to me and said, I don't want to see you riding around on any public land, you hear? I nodded. Don't worry, officer, I understand where my property ends and would never dream of trespassing on public land like Kenny has done to me. A week later, I received notice that Kenny was being taken to court for the trespassing. I submitted my evidence and testified about all the times he had illegally ridden his ATV through my hunting ground. The judge ordered Kenny to pay a $500 fine and sentenced him to six months probation, during which time he is not allowed to step foot on my land. He also has to submit to random inspections to make sure his ATV is not on my property. Kenny was livid at me for taking legal action. He came over one day cursing and called me an unfriendly neighbor. I calmly told him if he had respected my land from the beginning, none of this would have happened. He brought it all on himself. I'm just relieved I finally stopped Kenny's trespassing for good. Thanks to my meticulous documentation and steadfast pursuit of justice, my private hunting ground is peaceful once again. The deer are back and I can enjoy my secluded woods without Kenny's obnoxious ATV disrupting the quiet. This experience taught me that you can't back down when you're in the right. With determination and evidence on your side, sometimes you have to stand up for yourself against inconsiderate neighbors like Kenny. I'm glad I invested in those game cameras and surveillance equipment. They helped deliver the justice that was long overdue. The next one is a pro-revenge story. Let's start this story by saying this happened 12 years ago. I'm now happily married with three children and regret absolutely nothing. I was with my new ex for three years. I had noticed that she was being extremely controlling. I was expected to give every little detail of my day and tell her my schedule in advance and if I deviated from that, she would be very upset. She chalked it up to just bad feelings she was having and shrugged it off as her paranoia from past relationships and infidelity. I had never once cheated or strayed, and I never gave her a reason to act like this. It felt unbecoming of my fiancé to act in such a way. Now, this is where it gets juicy. After she had asked for my schedule to make plans, 
as mine tends to be more hectic than hers, I noticed she was texting someone. In my line of work, if I put in more than 40 hours, I have the ability to take time off at will as long as the work is completed at a later date. I was very good friends with a brother and still am. We laugh about this to this day, and he actively reminds her of it. I messaged him stating I wanted to do something special for her a little bit earlier than our anniversary to make sure it was a special surprise. They both worked in the same fabrication facility. He was a fabricator and she was a shipping manager. He was kind enough to let me know her schedule. That's where the discrepancy falls into place. Without my knowledge, she was foregoing overtime. She worked 12-hour shifts Monday through Friday, with the exception of Wednesday when she would only work half a day. She had been taking Wednesdays off right around the time that she started getting extremely controlling. Lucky for me, I had stacked several days of leisure time up, so taking a Wednesday off for me was not an issue. A few days go by and Wednesday's here. I put on my work gear and leave for work. I was expecting her to leave as our apartment complex had two exits on the same road I could see directly across from a shopping center, so I parked my car near the back and waited. After about an hour, I noticed a very specific red Mustang with a specific decal on the back window. It was her cousin by marriage. I had also done my due diligence to take an old laptop, which we kept on our desk in an office area with a full view of the living room, bedroom door and bathroom plus the kitchen. I had set it up for remote access and had it alert me when the webcam noticed movement. Giving her the benefit of the doubt, I thought he may be dropping something off or coming over to assist her with something, as her family sometimes does. Sure enough, a message came through so I remote into my laptop. He walks through the door without skipping a beat. She unbuttons his shirt and begins kissing him. I created a URL link for the live stream and as she was preoccupied, we had a family group text and a friend group text. They were both part of it, but at the current time, they were currently indisposed and didn't look at their phones. They didn't even wait. They could have gone to the bedroom, but no, they decided to get intimate right there on the couch. I sent the link off to the friend group chat and the family group chat. Within minutes, I'm getting calls nonstop from friends and family alike. There was no turning back. She was getting bombarded but she was ignoring her phone. Not until the fourth or fifth call came through did they decide to take a break. For context, the state I live in allows recording of personal property regardless of occupancy. I was the only one on the lease. She wasn't allowed to be on the lease because of poor credit. The call she had picked up was from her cousin's mother, who she was involved with romantically. She answers the phone on speaker, and I kid you not, the first words out of his mother's mouth were, Stop being with my son. They both became rigid and she began to stutter over her words, saying, What are you talking about? etc. The mother then divulged that there was a live feed of them sent out by me to her family. She grabbed every pillows off the couch and covered herself up. The cousin staggered off, trying to put on his pants and shoes, just to trip himself up and bang his head off my coffee table, leaving it with a divot. By this time I had made my way to the front of the apartment complex. I was there to confront the adulterer as he came out of the front exit. He froze and began to cry, apologizing profusely. I'm not going to lie. What happened afterward wasn't my best moment, and I nearly got into legal trouble if it weren't for the fact that he was trespassing on private property. Let's just say I had a cast for six weeks, and he wasn't in any family photos for months. I went up to the apartment where she was now fully clothed and crying inconsolably. I asked her if it was snot or something else on her face. Then I told her not to answer because it didn't matter anyway. I gave her one hour to remove all her belongings, as again everything in the apartment was mine except for clothes, some makeup, and a few kitchen utensils. Her mother would not let her move in, as she was just filled with embarrassment. The same went for her brothers, and the cousin's mother kicked her son out. Rumors spread around our town very quickly, and for a lack of better words, she was untouchable. The next one is a petty revenge story. So, I've worked in the service industry for a decent amount of time and in a few different cities. I landed a job in one of these new cities at a restaurant that has a few locations across the state and is moving to expand to a couple of other states. When I applied, I specifically stated I would prefer to work mornings. A night or two a week would be fine if necessary. But prior to getting this job, I had been physically assaulted when leaving work at around 1 a.m. 
I didn't give the full story during the interview, but I did make it clear that I was looking for a schedule that didn't involve late nights, and the manager I interviewed with said that was completely doable. I got a call a day later saying I had gotten the job, I was bartending, and went through training, and everything seemed fine. This place was open from 8 a.m. to 2 a.m. every day. The busiest times were for brunch every day and then the late night bar crowd. My first schedule out of training was all closing bar shifts. I was a bit put off because of the schedule conversation during the interview, but I went with it and gave them the benefit of the doubt, especially knowing that when you're bringing in six new hires, it can be hard to get everyone's schedules straight. More time went on and I was still working mostly nights, maybe one morning shift sprinkled in every so often. I brought it to the hiring manager's attention and he said they would try to get me more morning shifts. I went along with it for a while without seeing any change. Eventually, I brought it to the GM's attention and let him know that when I was hired, I was given the impression that I would be a daytime bartender, and I had been stuck working shifts where leaving at 3 a.m. was getting out of there quickly. He gave me a little bit of an attitude and told me that all employees were required to work any shifts assigned to them. Obviously, I knew that but it was incredibly irritating that I was told one thing before I actually accepted the job and now I'm working the opposite schedule. The GM was an unbearable human, incredibly sexist, thought he was always the smartest and best-looking person in the room, and so on. He was constantly belittling the employees in the guise of training. Fast forward to a couple of weeks after my conversation with him. I had finally been scheduled a brunch shift on a Saturday morning. This place didn't take reservations and people were lining up outside the door at 7.30 in the morning. I was bartending with two other people behind a pretty small bar. It maybe sat 15 people, but in a circle, so not a lot of room for three people to be back there. We opened, and it was incredibly busy, but everything was running smoothly. A couple of hours into the shift, one of the hoses from the dish machine got loose and just started spraying water all over that side of the bar. I, of course, was the one on that side and it completely drenched me before we could grab the hose and shut the dish machine off. My face and hair were soaking, but the real humiliation came from the fact that the uniform shirt I was wearing that morning was white. I immediately headed to the bathroom to dry my face, and one of the servers followed me in to make sure I was okay. You could obviously see everything through the shirt, and after I had composed myself I went to the GM to get a new shirt to get back to work. He told me he didn't have the time to get the keys and go through the bins to get one. I was shocked. It took me a minute, but I got back behind the bar and was incredibly upset and knew that this would be my last shift. I worked for about another 30 minutes. I took orders from bar guests and pulled as many service well tickets as I could. We were in the heat of service at that point, and every spot in the restaurant was full. Every service well ticket I pulled I crumpled up in my hand, and every order I took I never rang in. After that half hour, I excused myself to the bathroom, grabbed my things, and left. I knew that everyone who complained about things taking too long would have their food ash drinks comped. A part of me felt a little bit guilty for doing what I did only for the guests' sake. The larger part of me felt good because that disrespectful a-hole was going to have to apologize to everyone and let them know they would be taken care of. I've never been humiliated in that way at any place I've ever worked. Looking back on it, I have no regrets. To the people that put up with management or ownership's bullcrap, don't do it. Find a place where you're treated with respect, they do exist. The GM was fired a few months later for stealing. The next one is a malicious compliance story. First time posting here, so apologies for any mistakes. This story dates back to about nine years ago, when I, 31M at the time this took place, worked as a lead IT technician for a very large multinational company. It's a bit long, so sorry about that. The company had a range of different laptops available for employees to choose from that were classified by their size and weight. This is important later. Including standard laptops, that is, a typical laptop with a 14 inches screen, as well as lightweight laptops, smaller, thinner, and with a 12.5 inches screen, handy if you're a frequent traveler. Most of these laptops were pretty boring, Gray, business devices, nothing special to look at. Anyway, one day the computer manufacturer introduced a new lightweight laptop model that was silver in color and far more sleek and good-looking than the previous gray model. We'd deployed a few of these around the building and soon got a visit from a lady who'd seen one of her colleagues with a shiny new silver laptop. 
and had developed a severe case of shiny device envy. I'll call her shiny employee, S.E., for the purpose of this story. S.E., how do I go about getting one of those smaller laptops? Me, your current standard laptop isn't due to be replaced yet, but you can request a change to a lightweight laptop on the IT website. Your manager will need to approve it, however. Now, to be honest, I wasn't a particular fan of people who waste the company's money simply by wanting the latest shiny gadget, especially because it creates additional work for my team and involves replacing equipment that is still perfectly functional and within warranty, but I behaved in a professional manner and simply towed the company line. SE walked away, and the next day an approved request came through for a lightweight laptop. Fair enough. What she didn't know was that company policy dictated that we only provided a brand new laptop if we didn't have usable second-hand laptops in stock, that is, those handed back to IT from people who'd left the company. Being the good IT tech that I am, I scoured our return shelf, and sure enough, there was a used lightweight laptop in stock. Unfortunately for this lady, it was last year's gray model. But rules are rules, so I asked one of my team to prep it for her. She's then told that it's ready and comes along to pick it up. She takes one look at it and promptly throws a tantrum. S.E. This isn't the one I wanted, I wanted the silver one. Me. Sorry, company policy is that we can only order a new laptop if we don't have usable second-hand ones in stock. S.E. But this is not the one I ordered. Me. Yes, it is. You ordered a lightweight laptop, and this is exactly what we've set up for you. I turn the laptop over and show her the company sticker confirming it to be the same classification of lightweight laptop as her request, and show her that it is physically smaller and lighter than her existing laptop. S.E.E. No, I wanted a new silver one. This is unacceptable. I'm going to complain to your boss. She stormed off in a huff, and I could soon hear her complaining inside my boss's office. Unfortunately, although my boss knew I was just following process, he couldn't handle all of the repeated moaning and soon folded and asked me to order a new device for her. I wasn't at all pleased at being overruled when I was simply applying company policy, particularly when it's just a waste of money for an SE that wants the latest silver gadget, so cue malicious compliance time. I could have just scoured our shelf of brand new laptops and dug out a new one for her. We installed dozens of laptops a week. It was a big company, so we always had plenty of new ones in stock but I was told to order a new one, so that's the process I'd follow. Me. Okay, we can order a brand new silver one for you, but you'll need to raise another request ticket so we can order the laptop from it. I said this knowing full well that this ticket would go to SE's manager once again for approval, a manager who has a finite department budget. Sure enough, an hour later I get a phone call from SE's manager. Manager, why is SE ordering yet another laptop? Me. She didn't like the color of the laptop we'd prepared for her. It was gray, and she wanted a silver one. Manager, how much is this going to cost me? Me, well, you'll still be paying the monthly lease costs on SE's original laptop as it wasn't due for replacement, plus the lease costs of the lightweight laptop we prepared for her earlier. And there'll also be the lease costs for this new laptop as well. Manager, oh, hell no, I'm not paying for all that. I'll reject this ticket and I'll have a word with her. A short while later, Essie returns. She's rather quiet and humble now after being chastised by her boss for trying to waste all his budget in the pursuit of having the latest shiny silver gadget. She quietly accepts the gray lightweight laptop we'd prepared earlier for her, and then quickly departs. I spend the rest of the day with a grin on my face. The next one is an entitled people story. Backstory, in the early to mid-90s, around when I was 13 and my brother 15, we traveled from our home state to my dad's current state to spend the summer with him and meet his wife for the first time. We didn't have much of a relationship with our dad. He was largely absent in our lives, moving to his new state when I was six. His wife turned out to be awful. She started out nice but slowly became very mean, treating me like a slave and making me take care of her grandchildren the entire summer. Me and my brother were miserable. My mom ended up bringing us home because all she did was make us do chores. I didn't mind helping, but I did all of it. And I started my period, and she said she was too busy to go get me pads. I had one in my carry-on bag, and we were close to going home, so I stuffed my underwear with toilet paper and saved the pad for the airplane ride. Fast forward, she dropped us at the doors to airport. Didn't even come in to check us in. Dad was at work. We get in there and find our hour connecting flight at our layover stop would be late, and we would be stranded in that airport. 
Brother called our mom from a payphone, and she called my dad's house, where his wife informed her that she knew this. The airport had called her, but she was too busy with her grandkids, and didn't have the time to deal with us, and we would have to figure it out. I started crying and told my mom I would rather sleep in the airport than go back to their house anyways. A very nice couple and their children saw me crying and came over to help. They were on the same flight as us and had worked it out to get a flight to an airport three hours from our house. They helped us get on the same flight and stayed with us till they were able to hand us over to our mom and stepdad. Wonderful man. And they drove us home. I still have not totally forgiven my dad for not only letting her treat us like crap, but staying with her after she abandoned us in an airport when I was only 13 years old. But for my grandparents' sake, I have been civil with him. I will never speak to her again, though. I had the opportunity to tell her how I felt when she tried to friend me on Facebook, and that is the only time I have spoken to her in 31 years. I like to send greeting cards and would send some to my dad every once in a while. I always only addressed it to him. She got butthurt and complained to him about me not addressing her in the cards, and he in turn complained to my grandma who complained to me. I said fine, guess I am not sending him cards ever again, and I haven't. I can't believe she feels so entitled and delusional as to think she should get cards from me after she abandoned me and my brother in an airport far from our home. Grandparents are both dead now and I don't think I will ever see him again. He texts me from time to time and I will answer it, but I do not go out of my way to speak to him. My stepdad walked me down the aisle and my kids call him grandpa. Thank you for watching, I would really appreciate it if you could like the video and subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. We'll see you again tomorrow.